Hello everybody, Jade Hamilton here um, and today I'm going to continue our story um, which is You're Not the Boss of Me by Catherine Wilkins but before I do I'm going to do a couple of tags um, First being on Wednesdays we wear pink, which is hosted by the lovely Shara at Reborn Living Dolls. Um, she's on our holidays at the moment, but do go and check her out and subscribe to her if you haven't already. She's a lovely lady with lovely babies. Um, if you like your doll clothes pink and girly and floral and things, that she's your lady to go to. She's a lovely lady. She's full of fun. And, you know, she does a lot to support us in the, the doll slash cub community. Um, also, we're going to do a tag that's new to me that I think has been around for a while, which is Moving with Baby, which is run by Penny of playful rebounds now penny is a lady who um she she loves um role playing with her babies um she involves her whole family in the channel she again she's another lady that's full of fun full of spirit clearly loves um having dolls in her life and sharing that with the world but if you haven't subscribed to her already, do. She's fabulous. I've got my little Saskia Claire with me today. Now, Saskia is a Cuddles and Friends bear that I found on eBay. Nobody wanted her. She was going for four quid. And I just fell in love with her and I brought her home to me and she's been here ever since that was about about a month ago give or take i think um but yeah she's got because today is on wednesdays we wear pink she's got a lovely pink outfit on it's from a brand i hadn't really heard of before um which is called i do i do which I got as part of a bundle on Vinted. And it's got this lovely, fleecy, very pale, shell pink uh, top that's got... Oh, let's see what we've got on your top, baby girl. I think it's a kitten. A kitten with a white bow around her neck. And there's also, I think, a little bunny rabbit, too, with a pink jewel bow around its neck. And the top is covered in little gold sequins, so it's very blingy and sparkly, which Saskia loves, don't you, pop it? And underneath the top, we've got this beautiful little jewel ballerina skirt now Saskia is she is say she's a cuddles and friends bear which means she's slightly wider than your average builder bear which is what I normally um collect um so three to so not the three months fits her beautifully and as I say I've never heard of this I do brand before but I think I will have a look out for them again because this, this is beautiful. Um, Saskia's also got a, a white bib on with bright yellow trim, which matches the bright yellow patches in her fur. No shoes yet because Mummy's got to find her some proper shoes that will fit her little paws, hasn't she? Yeah. Um, now on to the second tag, which is moving with baby. 
um, as I am in a wheelchair, I have cerebral palsy, um, my movement is a little bit restricted, but I do like to do a little bit of adaptive yoga. So I thought um, Saskia and I could do a couple of yoga poses for you today. First thing we're going to do is a tree pose. Now a tree pose you go up like this and you stretch your arms as high as they'll go. Can you stretch Saskia? Stretch those little paws up. Good girl. Good girl. Wow, you're getting good at this, aren't you? There we go, both paws up. Good girl. Hold it there. Hold it there, hold it there, hold it there. And stop. Now, we're going to do one of Mummy's favourite poses, which is called a flower pose, which is where you bend your legs up and you slide your hands under your legs. Now, I can only really do this with one hand, so it's a slightly lopsided power, but here we go. There we go. Now, let's see if Tatia can try it. Put your hands up here. Next, my darling. Good girl, that's it. Well done. Clever girl, Saskia. That will give you nice strong muscles, won't it? Because yoga helps keep your body nice and strong. So, thank you very much to Penny and Shara for administering those tags for us. And now on to our story, um, which is You're Not the Boss of Me by Catherine Wilkins. Um, as per all videos where I read, um, all copyright goes to Catherine Wilkins and to Nosy Crow. I own absolutely nothing and right, sit down, make yourself comfortable, um, grab yourself a hot drink if you've got one, grab yourself an extra blanket if you need to because it's still maybe a bit chilly. I mean it's warmed up where I am but in some other parts of the world it may still be a bit chilly so grab yourself an extra blanket if you need and we will begin Sorry guys, technical problem. I'm going to have to pause you for a second. So sorry. Chapter 5 By the time we finish up, as I finish our notes, I wish I realised the hall has filled up. This is really happening. We survey the various different groups of people standing around waiting, chatting together. There's a boy in our year called Harry, who I don't think likes me. It's hard to say why exactly. It might be because I always beat him in maths tests. 
or it might be because one break time no one could open the bottle of coke including him and then I managed to and he tried to claim he loosened it for me but loads of the boys made fun of him and said he was puny even though they couldn't open it either or it might be because this one time at the end of term Christmas party I accidentally hit him quite hard with the piazza bat and he kind of screamed but it was honestly a total accident. He got laughed at that day too. Not sure why he's here wanting to make comedy when he doesn't like being laughed at. Anyway, he's one of the boys that always tries to get in jibes about how I'm a loud know-it-all and stuff. But like, hello, those are some of my greatest strengths, not weaknesses. So I don't care. It's the classic Socrates thing in action. Ugh, those guys are here. Sadie clack, clocks Harry and rolls her eyes. Harry is standing with Max and my friend Anil. To be fair, I'm neutralish on Max. But he always laughs and joins in. Otherwise, he's a bit inoffensive to me, a bit nothingy. So weird how Anil likes them now, says May. My stomach flips a little bit as I think about how Anil started blanking me when they moved into year nine and tried to get in with them instead. Um, for those not familiar with the UK school system, year nine is when you're 14. So about sort of, yeah, 13, 14. So about seventh grade, I think. About that sort of time. Um, I, I'm not completely sure if this is accurate three American school grades. Please feel free to put me in the comments if I get it wrong. But yeah, so year nine is sort of 13, 14. Um, my stomach flips a little bit as I think about how Anil started blanking me when we moved into year nine and tried to get in with them said, And also, for those not familiar, blanking is when you don't talk to somebody at all. You act as if they don't exist, as if they're invisible, um, as if there's a blank space where the person would be, as it were. And tried to get in with them instead. I reckon Anil thinks Max and the Harry are cool. Anil thinks Max and the Harry are cool, I say. I think Max and Harry think they're cool too, says Sadie, and we chuckle. Max swishes his floppy hair right then, which makes us laugh more. I notice a girl called Lexi join Harry, Max and Anil. Lexi plays guitar and has the bottom half of her head shaved, but you can't really tell because the rest of her hair just covers it. She's quite funny in a sarcastic sort of way. She does these, she does brilliantly hilarious insults to people. Even if they're directed at me, I'm still genuinely impressed at her creativity. She clocks me and pulls a face. Bossy McGoody Goody is here, she tells the boys. Not one of her best singers. They look over at us. Nerd alert! Lexi adds happily, then, I'm kidding, come join us. She waves us over. We shrug to each other and gingerly step towards them. Sadie and May clearly don't want to join them, but they also don't want to ignore a direct request or cause a fuss. Let's not assume negativity, though. Maybe they want to be friendly. Maybe I've imagined any animosity and nobody even remembers the coke bottle or the piñata incident. Hey, 
But now the one nerd face nearly knocked you out at the Christmas party, Harry. Lexi grins and the other boys snigger. Then again, maybe they do. Whatever, Harry shrugs. Hi, Amy. And they all smile. Sadie, May. They all nod curtly at each other. I'm glad you're here, says Max. You'll be good at this. I'm a little blown away. Here I am finding Max a bit lank, and yet he recognised my genius as a writer performer. Thanks, I respond happily. I mean, wow! Who would have thought my reputation could go before me in such a manner? I do my funny impression of Miranda Sings again to show them that they were crack to put their comedy faith in me. This time I add some of that comedy dance and sing Do the Miranda, high-pitched. And Neil properly laughs. That's really good! It's always good to have singers, adds Harry. Ah, okay. Better nip this in the bud now. Yay, I reply. Also, I and Sadie and May here want to write some sketches too. We have loads of great ideas, I beam enthusiastically. The faces of all three boys drop. Their easy warmth that the easy warmth that they briefly afforded me has instantly vanished. They frown at me, perturbed. We're gonna write it, says Harry. We've got enough writers, confirms Max. Can't just decide that, I protest in shock. You can't write the whole thing. And anyway, it's for anyone who wants to write the sketches and audition. Okay, listen up. Mrs. Haig strides into the middle of the crowd. There are too many, there's too many of you here for me to watch auditions, excuse me. I'm too busy. So long story short, I'm going to delegate. Oh, Harry puts up his hand. Yes, Harry. Miss me and Max and Anil can hold all the comedy auditions and we can just pass on the best ones for your approval. And you only have to look at the dancing and singing stuff. Mrs. Haig appears to consider this for a moment and then looks relieved. That could work, she agrees, nodding. She just wants an easy life. Well, not today. No! I shout outraged. Amy, no shouting out, please, says Miss Haig. But Miss, you can't give them the right to veto. I plead they might as well be in charge. We're not in charge. Mrs. Haig is clearly in charge, says Harry, smugly. Yes, Harry, I am very much clearly in charge. Thank you, echoes Mrs. Haig. Oh, he's astute, that Harry. I'll give him that, the shrewd evil genius. But Miss, please, I keep trying. They'll just give all the opportunities to their friends. It won't be fair. Amy, says Harry condescendingly. We're just trying to make Mrs. Haig's load a little lighter and the show run a little more smoothly. This is a team effort. Maybe get on board with that and stop trying to cause trouble. Yes, stop trying to cause trouble, Amy, says Mrs. Haig. But... That's enough now. I'm not going to change my mind. So anyway, moving on. I can't believe it. I'm livid and devastated. My dreams of being crushed by this little suck-up who thinks he owns all of comedy writing. I would have shared with everyone. Why can't they share with me? I want to cry, but I don't want to give them the satisfaction. They're so clearly never going to allow any of my sketches. Well, Amy, Harry shrugs his shoulders and smirks at me again. I guess, long story short, we're the writers. The rest of them chuckle. Ugh. 
the extra burn of zinging me with Mrs. Haig's catchphrase, which, to be fair, is such a solid foot down, I am almost impressed. Except I'm not impressed. I'm angry and I want to cry. This is so much worse to me than being called fat could ever be. Because I actually have a very healthy BMI. And even so, that's a weird metric to judge people by. Okay, let me, okay, look, you have to let me work for it. I say, we're good. I just as you say, you may, you need us. Um, there's my, I'm not sure I'm really. She trails off. Yeah, I'm out, says Sadie. What? I turn on him, shocked. Excuse me a moment. I address Harry, whose smirk now seems bigger than his face. The three of us step back a couple of metres. What do you mean you're out? I ask. This is a, just a setback. You said you were excited and invested in this. No, I said you've got me ever so slightly invested in this, replies Sadie loftily. I only wanted to do it if it was easy, fun and easy, not if it was an uphill battle with a bunch of bullies I'd rather, I'd rather not hang out with. Yeah. They're clearly never going to let any of your sketches through, adds me. Oh, so it's like that, is it? I address them sternly. As soon as things get tricky, you just give up on your dreams. Yep, says Sadie, and it's your dream, not ours. Well, what if Evelyn Pankhurst said, Oh, I only want the vote if it's easy and they just give it to us. What if Rosa Parks had... I get it, Sadie cut me off, but still, no. I was just here for the lols and it doesn't look like there'll be any. Yeah, they agrees. Unbelievable, I admonish them. You guys are rubbish. Having some trouble? Harry asks gleefully. No, I turn back to him crossly. You can't just make people do things they don't want to do, May tells me. Oh dear, oh dear, bad people skills, simpers Harry. I guess I'm more of a natural leader than you. Come on, Amy, let's just go, says May. This isn't worth it, agreed Sadie. Oh yeah, well this isn't over, I yell at Harry and then... Half storm out, half silly cough with Sadie and May, like three cowardly little lions. Chapter 6 Despite my comedy dream set back, and notwithstanding Sadie and May's joke about me burning my house down, I'm, I'm excited when I get home to see my masterpiece of cooking. This shall be my defining success of the day. There's quite an acerbic bitter smell in the air when I get home and I soon discover that it is indeed coming from the oven. Though not an actual fire, yay, I realise that this still does not bode well. But it will be okay. I, Amy Miller, am a very calm and adaptable person, but also... Damn! I quickly open some windows and doors and. Or rather, but also, damn! It's quite smoky when I open the oven to have a look in the casserole dish. I quickly open some windows and doors so the smoke alarms don't go off. I grab some oven gloves and carefully carry the dish outside to open it on the patio. You would never know what I'd put in. All that's left is charred, black, burnt stuff, really congealed at the bottom. I guess my family's oven's lowest setting isn't as low as a slow cooker after all. But let's not panic. 
I still had plenty of time to throw together an advertising meal for a family of five. I look through all the food cupboards. We don't have loads in until someone goes shopping. Plus, I put most of the remaining tins into my not a slow cook a slow cooker plan. But there are five pot noodles at the back behind the dried mung beans. They'll do. I spy some avocados in the fruit bowl. They will add some vitamins. I am a fast improvising genius. On further inspection, after cutting into them, a lot of the avocado appears to be black because no one's eaten them on time. So by the time I've cut away all the bad bits, we're all just having one little piece of avocado on a side plate next to the pot noodles, which is actually quite a taffy meal after all. I lay the table with forks and boil the kettle, then set it down in the middle of the table, ready to pour the hot water into the pot noodles. There's still a bit of time after that, so I do all the washing up, put my burnt dish into soap, and finally put away the clean cutlery and crockery into the cupboard. It's been so long since anyone did this, I haven't realised it's actually quite hard. Perhaps, probably, because we keep buying random bits of replacement crockery. There's loads of it. All weird, non-matching, different size stuff. Kind of difficult to find a place for. Maybe the real reason we don't put crockery away is because there isn't, there actually isn't space in the cupboard if it's all clean at once. Still, I managed to squeeze most of it back in. Now I just have to wait for my grateful family to marvel at my delectable cooking skills. Six people asked me if everything was all right, Mum repeats for the third time. Six! She's still going on about that black eye. Well, I found Flounder, I'm bored of just saying sorry on a loop. If things weren't all right, you might be glad they were asking. Why does everything smell terrible before we even pour water onto these pot noodles? Asked Kaz. Let me answer that question with another question. You mean, why does it not smell even more amazing yet? Oh, don't worry. Kaz clocked the dish in, clocked the sink with my dish soaking in it. Got it. Everyone except Mum shuffles into their seats at the table, but their expressions remain unreadable to me as they survey their avocado and dehydrated flavourings. Is the avocado a starter? Asked Dad. Sure, I answer, pouring hot water into my noodle pot and passing the kettle over to him. So you did do a taffy meal? Queries Bell. Yes, let's go with that, I reply cheerily. I think this is take two. I think this is take two. Mum catches Dad's eye and then nods at the sink. Oh, Dad nods. Very resourceful, Amy, says Mum. Wow, praise from one of my parents. This is a success. Assuming you can clean that dish up, murmurs Dad. Anyone else for a cup of tea? Mum kicks off her shoes and goes to open the crockery cupboard. A lot of crockery falls out. It had been stacked up a bit precariously, if I'm completely honest. So yes, this might be on me. Some of it smashes. Some of it falls onto Mum's stocking feet. She shrieks, ow, 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 for God's sake, Amy, she yelled, do you ever think before you do anything, what did you imagine was going to happen when somebody opened the cupboard, maybe just open it slowly and carefully, I begin, you're bleeding, 
Dad jumps up. I think Amy's broken my toe, says Mum. I'm sure it's fine. I jump up to I'm really sorry. Dad puts his arm around her, around Mum and helps her limp out of the room. They're actually quite a cute couple sometimes, I think, as they shoot me filthy looks as if I am an idiot. But I am not an idiot. I know exactly who the culprit is here. Clatter. Chapter 7 The next morning I decide I am taking this clatter out. Marry Kondo style. My parents are so lucky I watched that show. I am a genius. I get up super early and ransack the cupboards. Anything that doesn't really match or doesn't fill me with joy, I put in a cardboard box. I wrap it into some, in some of the old newspapers we have lying around. Killing two birds with one stone, you're welcome. And I thank each item for its service before it goes in the box. Marie Kondo says to do that. I'm on a roll. I don't just want to do the kitchen. The whole house would benefit from this. But the kitchen is definitely looking much better. Why are you talking to the plate? Kaz has entered the kitchen and I didn't see her straight away. Are you, did you just thank that cup? It's sort of a Shintoism thing, I say. I'm Marie Kondoing the kitchen so no one else gets injured. Fascinating tale, replies Kaz, deadpan. I walk past her with my box as the rest of my family as the family enters the kitchen. Now is the perfect opportunity to do their bedrooms and get rid of all their clothes that don't fill me with joy. After all, I am on a roll. When I return from decluttering upstairs, I see that they're all enjoying a super smooth breakfast. And they don't realise that it's because of me that nothing smashes. Where's my newspaper? asked Dad. There was an article I wanted to keep. Well, I hope you thanked it, Kaz tells him, because it's gone. Before Dad can react, confused, Mum announces that her toe probably isn't broken and finally forgives me. So all in all, a great morning for Amy Miller. My successful morning gives me renewed strength to take my rightful place in the comedy show. At break, I type up the tacky sketch and another idea I had. And at lunchtime, I go to the first auditions. Ugh, they've actually set up a table for submissions. The pompous, self-important, villainous wazak. Now... If you're not familiar, wazak is a wonderful word. I think it originates in the West Midlands. Um, it's a, a wonderful way of calling somebody a bit of a, a wally, a bit of a twit. Um, I say it's just a wonderful word to use. <laughs> um, Stephen Fry one of the arbiters of all of these wonderful, uses twazak, which is a combination of wit and wazak, which I really love. So, yeah. The pompous, self-important, villainous wazaks. I know I shouldn't resort to slander, like the Socrates thing, but I'm not, because they are objectively wazaks. Only a wazzer would try to ban me from sharing my genius with the world. Also, I'm not saying it out loud yet. Amy! Harry affects being pleased to see me as I approach the table. Didn't expect to see you here. Hello, Harry, I reply airily. I have some sketches to submit. I hand in the printed pages. 
OK, we'll put them on the slush pile. Harry drops them on a messy pile of paper at his feet. Why don't you just read them now? I say, there's a process, simpers Harry. Why don't I just read it to you now, then? I pick, a, I pick my paper back up. I start reading my sketch out loud, really quite loud. Interior, day, school kitchen. Taffy the chef stands next to some school dinner ladies. Um, just to sort of, sorry, I keep interrupting. But yeah, Amy, bless her, has got her scene directions the one way, the wrong way round. You're supposed to say, um, and I speak as a scriptwriter, well, somebody who's on the road to becoming a scriptwriter. You're supposed to say, scene, blah, 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 um, interior, school kitchen, day. But she's got her, scene, her setting and her time directions the wrong way round. <laughs> but she's a first type, I so I think we'll let her off. People nearby stop what they're doing and listen. Welcome to the show. Today we are going to show some school dinner ladies how to zhuzh up a potato salad? I continue. Harry stands up. We don't have time for this! He shouts over me. As ever, you will never get to try these flavours again, darling. I continue loudly. Stop! Shouts Harry. Why? I yell back. A crowd has gathered, watching us. I think Mrs. Haig has noticed something is afoot, but she's pretending she hasn't. Look, we have a direction, asserts Harry. We don't think you can contribute anything to it. He surveys the crowd and then sneers. I mean, you've, li you've clearly just written about baking. What else are you going to write about? Periods and shopping? There are oohs and chuckles from the circle of people now surrounding us. I don't know why, I retort. Are you just are you just gonna write about how no one will go out with you? Laughter from the crowd. More than he got. Whoa whispers Matt. Ha ha burn on you shouts Riley of all people. Impressed that I've slammed dunk Harry. I definitely won that one. Okay, break it up, break it up. Mrs. Hague approaches. The crowd disperses a little. Why does the teacher intervene when I'm winning? We don't need to get personal, Mrs. Hague tells me. But hang on, he mentioned periods. That's pretty personal. What seems to be the problem this time? She adds tiredly. Amy's causing trouble again, says Harry, shamelessly deflecting, snitching and lying all at the same time. Miss, they're refusing to read my sketches. I explain. Are they? Why? Asked Mrs. Hay. I don't know. Apparently because I have periods, I offer. There's no need to bring that up, says Mrs. Haig. He shudders uncomfortably. Then she says to Harry, you're supposed to read all the sketches. Miss, Amy has the wrong idea, Harry lies. We just haven't got round to reading them yet. Are these the sketches? Mrs. Haig takes them from my hand and gives them to Harry. Read them now and give her feedback by next session, please. You were supposed to be making things easier. Wow, victory, I guess. Well, tiny hurdle victory. Now, 
Now, what have you got her doing in the meantime? Wait, they're not in charge of the whole thing, miss. Just that... No, Amy, if you'd hung around last time, instead of storming off, Freddy is going to be the shadow director. Shadowing me is I... Well, anyway, long story short, I'm sure Freddy has something for you to be getting on with. Freddy! Mrs. Hague calls him over. OK. Freddy is tall and shy, but he's also like best friend with Harry, Max and now Anil. Whatever happens next has a high probability of sucking. Set Amy up with a task, Mrs. Hague tells Freddy. Oh, I um, haven't re actually... Haven't really got anything for Amy at the moment, says Freddy. Ugh, this is humiliating. Why do these people get keep being put in charge of me? Why must life be this way? Also, this doesn't really feel like a shadowing mentorship direction type situation. It feels more like Mrs. Hayes just wants to sit down for a bit. Look, you have to give her something for the ne to do for the next session, says Mrs. Haig. It's an open plea. That means open to everyone who wants to take part. If you want to be a director, direct her. And please, everyone, try to be less disruptive from now on. Then Mrs. Haig flaps his off and sits on a chair at the edge of the hall. I knew she just wanted to sit down. Finally, Harry sighed, satisfied. Right, back to work, everyone. Then he addresses me. You seem to be burning through your nine lives, Amy. He smirks. You can't beat me, and you can't get past me. Why don't you just accept that there are some things I'm better at than you? No one wants you here. You don't have what it takes. Leave us alone. Oh dear, that's not very fair. Is it Saskia? No. I think Harry was being a bit mean, don't you? Yeah. Let's see what happens next, shall we? Chapter 8. There, there she is. I hear Mum's voice as I get in. Why the hell are all my clothes in a black bin liner outside? And mine, demands Cass, Cass. And, oh, why are you crying? Asked Dad as I enter the kitchen. I am bawling my eyes out by the time I enter my house. I'm so sad and angry. I wanted this so much. What's wrong? Mum always drops an oven glove and slams the oven door in shock. I think she just put a pasta bake in there. She rushes over and hugs me and she holds me at arm's length. Let's get you a tissue. She hands me one. I blow my nose. What's wrong? Tell me. My face crumples. I think I'm out of the comedy show. I start crying again. Mum leads me over to the table to sit down and gives me a glass of water, which I glug down in between sobs. Well, how can that be? Asks Mum. It's only just started. Why would anyone kick you out? You haven't have done anything wrong yet. They won't let me write for it. I gush in a hiccupy fashion. What? I thought it was open for everyone to write it. I thought that was the whole point. Three mean bo these mean boys have taken over the writing, I explained. Did you tell the teacher? I said, Mrs. Hague just let them. Ugh, Mrs. Hague, says Mum. Dad looks nonplussed. Drama, Mum prompts. Dad shakes his head. The one that 
thought we were someone else for ten minutes at parents' evening, says Mum. And when she said then, when she finally realised you were out of time, so she just went, oh, oh, long story short, Amy's probably fine. Oh, Dad nods at her. Exactly. OK, well, I'm bored, says Kaz. And I would still like to know what you were doing with my clothes. Oh, I, I was decluttering. Marie Kondo style, I explained. I thought I'd help by getting rid of anything that didn't bring me joy. Kaz makes an outraged, spluttering noise. Who cares if my pineapple jumper brings you joy? It's my jumper, it only has to bring me joy. Yes, it's not for you to be getting rid of her. Our clothes, agrees Mum. I love my purple I'm with stupid t-shirt. You can't just decide what we keep. Kaz pulls her face. Well, she sort of has a point about that one. Some of your clothes are holding you back, I proclaim. And this house is too cluttered. I was helping. Helping? You basically broke my toe, says Mum. You know what I mean. I say you're lucky I've been around and fixed everything. You asked me if I was going to help and I have. I was about to be super busy with the review. But now I guess I'll be stuck in the house just fixing stuff. I trail off miserably and I think I'm about to stop crying again. My family exchange looks that I can't read. Has nods and Dad appears to gesture to Mum to say something. Amy, begins Mum, you know, if you're really passionate about this comedy show, you should fight for it. Really? I blink up her. Absolutely, agrees Dad. Don't get up on something you love. That would get you out the house. That would get you out the house. Adds Kaz. That she, Mum shoots Kaz an annoyed look. We're raising three strong, independent women here. Asserts Mum. Not a bunch of critters. You need to be able to stick up for yourself. Don't let Anyone put you off your dream, continues Dad. You hear that, Amy? says Mum. We believe in you. Don't listen to those boys. They don't own the play. Write your sketches anyway. Fight your way through. Give them hell, encourages Dad. I think it could be really hard, though. I say, absolutely, cries Dad. You can do it. Can I do it? All by myself, without Sadie and Faye? Well, there's only one way to find out. Onwards! Well, I don't mean to toot my own horn, because that's frowned upon in British culture for some reason, but I am incredible at this. I mean, I have previously won a pen for writing, so obviously I am good. I decide to write three sketches in total to show my range. Firstly, I write a sketch about a teacher who's been hypnotised to fart every time someone says the word homework. I fear that everyone enjoys fart-based humour. Young, old, dad, not mum so much, but most people. Got to love those, play those odds. And farts are funny. Secondly, I write a sketch about a substitute French teacher coming in and the people in the class have swapped their names around. I figure it's good to keep a lot of it school-based to keep it relatable. Also, I think it's our job to lightly mock the teachers. In a nice way, and not a literal roast. Thirdly, I write a sketch about an e-boy making a video of how to do emo makeup. 
but he doesn't have any of the right stuff and his mum keeps yelling at him. Eventually he puts mustard and talcum powder in his hair. I was going to make this about an e-girl, but I already have lots of parts for girls and I thought, slightly cynically, if I made it a boy, they'd be more likely to they might be more likely to go for it, as it wouldn't like, look like the girls were taking over. Plus, I still have the taffy sketch, which I never got to read out properly. All in all, not a bad comeback, I think. Chapter 9. When I get to the session, there's no chance to perform my script. Mrs. Haig immediately takes them for me from me and hands them to Harry who puts them in yet another pile of paper then she pushes me over to Freddy and tells him to give me my directions for today's session then she goes back to sitting down um Freddy is awkward well what do you want to do Amy I want to write sketches I say but you can't do that says but you can't do that says Harry Unless we really like them after we read them, he amends quickly. She's good at singing, supplies that. Do you have something in that area? In fact, a mischievous look has appeared on Harry's face. Get Lexi to play for her. Lexi will hate that. Oi, Lexi, over here. Lexi appears. What? She says crossly. Freddie says you have a song for Amy to sing. You have to play a song for Amy to sing. What? I'm not playing for prior Facebook sing a lot. You have to, Max wins. These guys are positively drunk on power. Freddie is director. You have to learn to take direction, says Harry. Is that right? Lexi looks inquiringly at Freddy. Um, yes, that's right. Freddy tries to sound imposing, but falls slightly short. Ugh, fine. Lexi rolls her eyes. Come on then, choir girl. Let's go over there and demean music. The boys smirk. We head over to some chairs at the side of the side of the hall and walk past Steve Taylor spinning Mariella Simone round and round. I know Mariella is a big fan of Strictly and it looks like they're working on quite a crowd pleaser. That's cool, I think, absolutely. At least someone's happy in this process. Good. Lexi flops heavily down into a chair and I sit near her. Look, I don't mind singing as well, but it's not fair I'm being denied the opportunity to write. I elucidate to her. Yeah, yeah, fairness. Yeah, yeah, fairness. Lexi sounds bored. Did you have a song in mind? I mean, I'm frankly amazed that Mrs. Haig is being so negligent. I add hotly. Yeah, that's amazing. Like he says, monotone. What's your net? What's your range like? It's ridiculous that those boys, those boys, have been put in charge of us. What do they even know? The whole thing is so unfair. Oh my God! Stop! Why do you expect everything to be fair anyway? Oh. Something appears to click into place in Lexi's perception of me. Not used to it, are you? She grins teasingly. Not used to what? I ask. Bet you come from a nice family where everyone tells you your views are important. Well, yes. Welcome to the real world. Lexi seems unhelpfully amused. Lexi! My views are important in the real world, I tell her. Lexi laughs. Sure. Everyone's are, I assert. How huh, cute. Lexi says this as if I'm a tiny child telling her I love unicorns. 
Anyway, if you're done with your epiphany about world justice, I have some ground rules. There are songs that I will never play. I'm so delighted with her use of the word epiphany and intrigued by the songs she's blacklisted. I'm momentarily distracted from my my malaise. Ooh, like what? What won't you play? No hymns for starters, choir girl. Wow, okay, I say. I'm sure you're obsessed with them, but that's a red line. I'm not obsessed with hymns. I protest. You just sing them all the time. Nope, actually wrong. Not all the time. The choir sang memory from cats at the last full school, full school assembly, I point out. No Andrew Lloyd Webber, states Lexi. Aha, are you messing with me? I ask. Nope. You know I'm only in the choir because I really like singing, I say. Good. Now you can sing something good. It turns out Lexi enjoys a really eclectic bunch of different music. She likes some really old stuff, some indie bands I've never heard of, jazz, hip hop, and even some classical. We're able to not exactly bond, but at least agree over some pop music. We both like Adele, for instance. We practice doing some Adele together, which Lexi can play on the guitar, to see how it sounds. You're not terrible, Lexi tells me after a couple of goes, which is officially the nicest thing we've ever seen. To you. Said to me, Lex Lexi, yes, choir girl, do you write songs? Yes, yeah, so, why do you ask? She sounds a tiny bit defensive. You're really good with words, I tell her. What are you talking about? I really liked your word use of the word epiphany earlier. I explain, and sometimes when you insult me, I'm really impressed with the scope and creativity that goes into your abuse. Wait, wait, what? Lexi seems professed. What is going on right now? Are you trying to... Is this your way of... Are you mocking me? No, I really mean it. You like being taunted. No, I don't like it, but I am impressed by it. Some of it. What? Why would you even say that? Who talks like that? Are you sure you're not messing with me? No, I almost never lie, I say. Lexi stares, really appraising me. Finally, she says, you know, I was never sure if your whole earnest busybody thing was an act. Like to suck up or God knows what. But actually, but you actually, you actually mean what you're saying, don't you? Um, yes. I tried to process this. Like, you're not playing some weird game. You actually really don't care how uncool you are. I mean, I'm cool in my own way. I say, a tiny bit defensively. Lexi laughs. Yeah, good one. Wait a second, I say. Do you mean to tell me that you thought my real personality was some kind of act? Yes, Lexi nods. I thought it might be. But why? I couldn't work out why anyone would behave that way. I think it started with the turtles, she said thoughtfully. In PSHCE, um, for anyone not familiar, PSHCE is Personal, Social, Health and Citizenship Education. In my day, because I'm very, very old, it used to just be called PSE. And it's a bit like 
um, social studies in the States. You you go around and you have um, discussions about um, everything from changing bodies to politics to um, how to be a better citizen to how the law works, so all sorts of things. I think back and remember this lesson from last year. I do remember everyone acting, reacting quite weirdly to me and exchanging looks, but couldn't work out why. Yeah, says Lexi, I thought you were this try-hard, just showing off your knowledge to get attention. I'd just been watching Blue Planet, loads of David Attenborough stuff, I reply. I was genuinely really upset about the turtle hatching, not being able to use the moonlight to find the sea because of light pollution from the city. They were all falling down drains and drying and dying. It's so sad I could still cry. Yeah, so you repeatedly said. But now I know you really meant what you said. That's adorable. No one is usually that Lexi trails off, trying to unable to find the right word. Basic, I offer. Fringe. I was gonna say straightforward. She grinned. Okay, I reply. You're not doing anything, ironically. Is my real personality a character act? No. Nope. Lexi laughs again. You are funny though, and sometimes deliberately. Thank you, I exclaimed, shocked at this unexpected phrase. That was funny what you said to Harry earlier. It's so sweet of you to notice, I reply, still elated. Lexi chuckles. I'm so annoyed with him, I say. It all comes flooding back to me. The anger, the grief, the frustration at the injustice. Well, I still don't want to hear about it. So dial it down, says Lexi. But you don't think it's unfair that they've taken over for no re real reason and they're bossing us around? I don't care. This is just a thing to be got through. It is not, I cry. This is not just a thing to be got through. It's a wonderful opportunity. It could be, this could be truly amazing and fun. Please spare me a living my best life speech, says Lexi tiredly. But we could be living our best lives. Well, my irony-free friend, if you want to rage against the machine, you're going to have to go and do it somewhere else. Lexi shrugs. I don't understand Lexi's attitude at all. Is she pretending not to care? Is that why she's surprised that I don't really do pretending? She must care a bit. She, must, she cares enough about music to blacklist some of it. I wonder how much energy it takes to pretend you don't care about something when it actually really bothers you, just to appear cool. Doesn't she know being cool doesn't matter? Just ask Socrates. <laughs> and I think we'll... Hang on. Leave it there for today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, commenting. And it, it really makes my day when you do. And I'll see you soon. Can you wave, Saskia? Good girl. Cheerio, everyone.